What was the greatest night of your life? If you are over 21, it could be the night you met your partner, the night you had your first child, or some other mature and understandable life moment. If you are under 21, it was probably the night you went to the craziest house party with unlimited drinks, girls going wild, the perfect music playing, a car crashing into the pool, the SWAT team pulling up with a helicopter watching from above, then nearly the entire town catching on fire. Okay, you caught me. I just described the plot of Project X. It was just a movie. That didn't actually happen. Except it did. The story of how life imitates Hollywood with disastrous results. It's a wildly popular movie about an out of control teen party full of boozing, drugs, and big ticket destruction. The movie characters get away with just a hangover, but for real life teens copying these parties this spring break, the consequences are far more serious. After the movie Project X released, it inspired chaos all around the world, leading to some of the most out of control and occasionally deadly parties. Still to this day, young people attempt to live this fantasy by throwing Project X parties. But to understand the deep-seated obsession American teens have with this film, we must first analyze the four-step process that Project X took to manipulate their strategy on the big screen. The number one goal of this film was very simple. We knew from the beginning that uh, it had to feel like a real party. He can make something that seems so outrageous feel very real. It's, it's just fun, it's just so different. And the way it's shot, and, you know, the point of view style, is just, it, it's very um, organic. Organic, natural, uh, realistic. You know, it doesn't feel staged at all. You know, this is supposed to be every party that every kid would want to throw if they had the most amount of money possible. Yeah, he's just really got a good visual grasp of reality. It makes it more, you know, viable and more relevant that this party could occur and could happen like this. I don't think anyone will watch this movie and say this that did not feel like a real party. Make the film feel real. Step 1. Hire an all-star production team. Joel Silver, executive producer, also produced Die Hard and The Matrix. Marty Ewing, executive producer, also produced Blades of Glory and Holes. Todd Phillips, producer, basically worked on tons of legendary party movies of the early 2000s like Road Trip, Old School, and The Hangover. But another creative touch was hiring director Nima Nurazeda, who had no feature film experience but created an iconic Adidas house party commercial in 2008 that looks exactly like what Project X was would become. Nima's area of expertise was actually in music videos. Since the music and chaotic party scenes became such a memorable part of the movie, it makes sense that an experienced music video director was the reason why they looked and felt so damn good. Despite everyone behind the scenes being seasoned cinema veterans, on screen they wanted the cast to be nobodies. But before we get into step two, a quick word from today's sponsor. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome, top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based here in the US. Every month, they introduce their members to cool new products based on a preference quiz they fill out. They now offer a new membership program where you can get really great deals all year round. I'm talking like 30% off or more sometimes. And it's totally free to join. Preview your member shipment before it's sent. You'll get a customized selection of products picked for you, and before it's shipped, you can preview what's inside. Decide if you'd like to 1. Keep it, 2. Swap out products, or 3. Skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. Here are some of the boxes I got. The Carnivore. The box comes with this delicious American barbecue rib rub and this Messermeister meat cleaver. Now, I didn't have any chicken bones or ribs to test this baby out on, so this cute little lemon is about to get absolutely smashed. I also got the Turbo Box. And this box comes with Columbia Instant Coffee, Organic Blue Boon Whole Bean Coffee, Ethiopia Whole Bean Coffee, and Banner Dark Whole Bean Coffee. Now I drink coffee every single morning, so this box is perfect for me. I had to give the Organic Blue Boon a try, and normally I do two sugars, but this was so good I drank it black. To get a free mystery gift with your first membership purchase, click the link in the description and enter Patrick Gift at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com slash Patrick Gift. Step 2. Hire a relatable cast. Casting no-name talent was risky. As we all know, hiring A-list actors is one of the most effective ways to market a movie. However, there is a slight barrier with famous actors where their characters are hard to separate from their real-life personalities 
personality or from a previous role that you always associate them with. The fact that nobody knew the cast was what allowed viewers to feel like they were just some teenagers with a camera. The three main characters in Project X look like your regular, unspectacular high school kids. They aren't necessarily nerds, but rather anonymous, almost invisible. That's what makes them feel so relatable. They sort of blend in, just like most of the people you went to high school with. Even the high school they filmed in is depressing, outdated, and prison-like, which is extremely accurate to American schools. To find inexperienced actors, the casting directors created open auditions on the website projectxopencall.com. The header on the site let people know the movie was created by the same producer as The Hangover, which was a $277 million box office smash hit. People were asked to submit a three-minute audition video with the following guidelines. Tell us your most embarrassing story. Tell us your craziest party story. Tell us about your riskiest or most daring thing you've ever done. If you wanted to impress someone at a club, show us how you would dance. Or show us the one thing that you do that makes your friends laugh. After sifting through tens of thousands of submissions, they were able to discover one of their leads, Jonathan Daniel Brown, otherwise known as JB. The other two leads, Thomas Mann and Oliver Cooper, were found through traditional casting. Thomas had acted in one movie previously, and Oliver had no previous acting experience. Which is surprising because many people felt that his performance carried the energy throughout the film. What up, my lovely females? This is your boy Costa, your host for the evening. Behind me is Thomas Cub's house. Today is Thomas Cub's birthday, and this is Project X. It's also worth mentioning that the trio does kind of resemble the cast of Superbad, not just the way they looked, but even their characteristics. This was likely intentional as well. As mentioned before, these actors were no names in Hollywood, so casting people that looked or felt like the Superbad crew, which was made just a few years before and already secured a legacy as one of the most accurate depictions of high school Americans in cinema, was definitely a big brain decision. There also was a fourth member of the crew. His name was Dax, otherwise known as Dax Flame on YouTube. Another possible marketing strategy as Dax had a large subscriber base of likely the target audience for this film. Plus, his character ties perfectly into step three. Step three film like an amateur. Dax was the man behind the camera. In the beginning of the movie, you learn that he is filming a home video of this party they are throwing for Thomas's birthday. So when you see shaky transitions between scenes, or characters not being perfectly in the frame, or the quality and focus of the footage varying in every shot, it helps sell the idea that this entire thing is just a home video. Dax was also a bit of an amateur filmmaker in real life, adding another layer of authenticity. This film style is commonly referred to as found footage, which created perhaps the most realistic component of all. Some of the footage that made it into the film was just one of the random extras holding a phone and filming what was going on. The production crew passed out camera phones, blackberries, and handy cams to the partygoers. Their vision being if a party this wild actually happened, many of the attendees would pull out their phones and film the chaos. The production crew thought it would be extremely difficult to manage this many extras. With 200 to 500 people showing up daily, how would they track the phones? How would they make sure the same people are coming back every night? But they saw the opposite result. The extras were extremely cooperative and didn't even want to leave. Keep in mind, this movie was filmed for 25 nights in a row, and they didn't just stage a party. They were partying. There technically was no downtime. While the production team was organizing the next scene, they still had a DJ playing music. People were dancing, swimming in the pool, for 25 days. Again, some of the footage you see in the film wasn't even staged. It was just the extras filming themselves actually partying. And what is a party? without the music. Step four, create the perfect soundtrack. The first song you hear in the movie is We Want Some P by Two Live Crew. Does it get any more lit than that? This film is jam packed full of music. It basically never stops because well, when does music ever stop at a party? The music supervisor hired for this film was Gabe Hilfer, who creates soundtracks on roughly five to seven major films every year. He's an expert. So when they told him the goal was to make it realistic, he executed perfectly. When he was asked about his vision for the soundtrack, he mentioned two major goals. One was to keep it authentic and make it feel like what these kids might really be listening to. And then two was to escalate the party and get into the heads of the kids and bridge the gaps between what they're listening to and the emotional feelings you're looking to have the audience feel as well. However, it's not exactly a versatile soundtrack. It's mostly hip-hop bangers that were released in the early 2010s like Trouble On My Mind by Pusha T and Blow Up by J. Cole, mixed in with classics like The Next Episode by Dre and Snoop as well as Nasty by Nas. But there are two EDM remixes that have been cemented in history as the songs of Project X. Any party that existed after this film was released would not be complete if these two songs were not played. Pursuit of Happiness, the Steve Aoki remix, 
and Heads Will Roll, the A-Track remix. These songs were strategically placed at a moment where the producers wanted to fully immerse the viewer into the climax of the night. At these moments, the plot doesn't matter. There is no dialogue. You're basically just watching a music video. These songs would go on to represent when your buzz is perfect, or your high is in the manageable sweet spot. The Heads Will Roll remix helped put DJ and producer A-Track in the spotlight. He immediately started booking larger venues and tours. Funny enough, he never made any money from the song. That Project X money must have stayed from Oh no, time. I make nothing on Heads Will Roll. That's a flat fee, remix fee. I got paid a very small amount in 2009. You know, how many shows did he get on? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it would be nice because I heard it's triple platinum. After this calculated four-step process, making this film feel as real as possible, it released in March of 2012 and was a certified smash hit, grossing $100 million worldwide. Critics pretty much universally hated the movie, with publications like NPR calling it a nasty, nasty piece of work. However, there was a point brought up by many critics that was definitely true, and they kind of predicted the future. Todd McCarthy from The Hollywood Reporter wrote, The wrap-up does not spare the boys, and Thomas in particular, of life-changing consequences for their delinquency, but a certain self-justifying feel-good impulse compels the filmmakers to imply that, even if they do nothing further of note in their lives, they'll always have this. And Patrick Gamble from Cineview had a very similar opinion. What's most repugnant about Project X is its utter lack of moral consciousness, with the overriding message being that such disregard for property and community deserves little more than a slap on the wrist. At first glance, these reviews come off as old people yelling at teenagers for having fun, but they are accurate here. After the SWAT team comes in, the town catches on fire, and everyone escapes the party running for their lives, the trio get abundant news coverage, become legends at their high school, resulting in a standing ovation from classmates. Thomas is still able to get the girl that loves him, and they show just a quick still of the consequences he faced, which were disturbing the peace, contributing to the delinquency of minors, and inciting a riot. Despite this, Costa is invited onto the news to promote his next party. Would you like to apologize? I got a better idea. How about I invite you to my next party? What? Yeah, you heard me, sugar. So is it crazy to think that a movie depicting, in the most realistic way possible, an epic party where the host ends up as a legend, who gets the girl and a little slap on the wrist, would inspire teenagers all around the world to do the same thing? If you said no, it's just a movie, and everyone knows it's fake, you'd be wrong. It didn't happen once, not twice, but so many times I can't even tell you about all of them in this video. But here are some of the craziest ones. Now it's been widely speculated that Project X is inspired by an infamous party thrown by 16-year-old Australian Corey Worthington. But this speculation has actually been denied by the producers and cast. Because it's based on real people, like that Aussie guy, that Corey Worthington period. Not really, I mean, it's kind of, no, this, this, this is really, was, I mean, it's just different. On January 12th, 2008, Corey Worthington learned his parents were going on vacation to celebrate the new year. So he hatched a plan to throw a party while he had the house to himself. Corey and his friends started to advertise the party on their MySpace and Facebook when the word spread like wildfire. The party was meant to be a small gathering, but soon turned into a full-blown rager. More than 500 people showed up, and the crowd was so large the party spilled out into the street. The crowd got out of control, and people started to throw glass and bricks and break neighbors' mailboxes. There were hundreds of kids causing destruction for no reason. The first police unit backed off until they were reinforced by a helicopter, dogs, and more well-equipped officers. After a few hours, police finally got the crowd to disperse. This made national headlines in Australia, but what made it so iconic was Corey's image and attitude when being interviewed on A Current Affair Australia. Take a few glasses and apologize to us. I'll say sorry, but I'm not taking off my glasses. But what would you say to other kids who were thinking of partying when their parents are out of town? Get me to do it for you. Get you to do it for you. Not don't do yes. it. Nah, get me to do it for you. Best party ever so far, that's what everyone's been saying, so. Maybe the Project X producers denied Corey as being the inspiration because it would look like they approve of this behavior. Because it only took a few days after the film's release for a Project X-inspired party to turn deadly. On March 14th, 2012, just 13 days after the film's initial release, 1,000 high school and college-age students in Houston, Texas attempted to recreate the events of Project X, but it turned deadly. 
It was being advertised as a foam party with promises of free alcohol and drugs. Women who wore bathing suits were granted free entry to the party, according to the flyer. Around 12.30 a.m., police responded to a noise disturbance at a foreclosed mansion in southern Houston. Upon arrival, they encountered hundreds and hundreds of teenagers scattered all over the property, using drugs and drinking illegally. Doing what needed to be done to keep everyone safe, police had to break up the party and started dispersing the crowd. As people made their way off the property, Property, tensions escalated, leading to an eruption of gunfire, which tragically killed 18-year-old Brian Spikes. Witnesses of the murder later said, kids took to the streets, but the parking lot was overpacked so you couldn't get out. It was just people in the actual street. They got into arguments and started shooting each other. Another witness to the killing had this to say, the gunman was just walking, and he pulled out a gun and started shooting, like for no reason. He shot the boy in the back of the head and he fell on the ground. He started shooting at the crowds, but then he ran through the field. Police chased the shooter through the field and into the woods, but lost him in the dark. After four months of a relentless investigation, they finally found the gunman. 22-year-old John Gibbs was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Crazy enough, there was another Project X party in the same city just four days before. Thirteen teenagers who planned the party broke into a brand new $500,000 home that was recently built, which they used to host an absolutely massive 2,000-person party. During the party, the insane crowd broke broke nearly every window in the home, put holes in almost every wall, ripped doors completely off the hinges, and left empty bottles of liquor everywhere. Among the bottles, sheetrock was across the floor mixed with the glass. All of this destruction managed to cause a grand total of $100,000 in damages. The building owner compared it to being hit by a tornado. What's mostly crazy about this particular party is that the host may have gotten away with it if it wasn't for a private investigator named Mark Stevens. Mark Stevens was hired by the builder of the home that was destroyed to investigate who threw the damaging party. When asked about the incident, he said, Look at what happened here. The parallels are just uncanny. They did, it was a copycat. They did everything they saw in the movie. The day after the party, Mark came back to the home to investigate. And at the time, Mark noticed another empty mansion down the street was having a party. Suspecting it was the same host, Mark called the police. And the group of 13 responsible for setting up the original party were taken into custody. When they asked why they did it, they simply said, Project X. But on the exact same night, chaos ensued in Houston. Houston, Calgary, Canada nearly witnessed the same disaster. Calgary high schooler Hunter Mills tweeted that Project Chris, a Project X style party, would be hosted at his buddy Chris Morey's house. Hashtag Project Chris went viral on Twitter, trending in Australia, Asia, and the Middle East. Luckily, the party was called off due to an overwhelming amount of interest, but it actually ended up getting moved to a new location, a bar. And eventually about 200 people showed up to this bar, but the venue had to close for the night because they couldn't handle the overwhelming amount of people. People. But while being interviewed on the local news, Hunter Mills showed up in a custom t-shirt with the hashtag Project Chris printed on the front. This was not the last time a hashtag would lead to a party's downfall. Hashtag Ross Morgan Rager blew up on Twitter in May of 2012 after a student from North Allegheny High School in Pittsburgh was planning to throw a party. His buddies tweeted the hashtag Ross Morgan Rager and within hours it was trending internationally. Word spread throughout the entire city within hours and every kid in Pittsburgh was planning on attending the party. In the following days, high school teachers were ordered to read this email aloud to their classes. Bottom line, there is no party at Ross's house. The local police are aware of the rumor. Ross's parents are aware of the rumor. Every effort via Twitter has and continues to be made to expose the rumor as a hoax. Ross Morgan and his parents had to vacate their house for the weekend, and they even had to hire an off-duty police officer to watch the house while they were gone. But Ross secured his legacy when he went on the local news to praise his classmates. What it has done for the school is, is truly amazing. Everyone now is now friends, which what we thought wouldn't happen with uh, less than 20 days left of our senior year it has brought us all together. I'm sure by now you're noticing a trend of all these parties following the same exact plot as the movie. Someone wants to throw a party and their buddy spreads the word via text or social media. Then it gets out of hand. But the key part is getting on the local news afterwards, just like the movie, to certify your legacy. However, for this Utah teen, her interview on the news wasn't celebratory because her party led to five people being gunned down. In March of 2012, 16-year-old Destiny McCubbin's parents were going out of town and she decided to take the opportunity to host a party. She was quoted saying she wanted the party to be like Project X. 
the North Salt Lake City, Utah teen said goodbye to her parents on Friday night and she invited around 50 people to her house. Then 170 showed up. Neighbors complained, but only asking her to keep the noise down. Little did Destiny know, members of the Norteños gang showed up at her party. Their rivals, the Isai Longos, heard the Norteños were at the party and decided to confront them. Destiny tried her best to prevent the situation from escalating, and when she opened the front door to ask them to leave, things nearly got deadly. And as soon as I opened the door, they just started shooting. This guy just started shooting and it hit me in the foot. As Destiny sat on the floor bleeding profusely from her foot, she said, I was just in shock. I couldn't believe what was going on. And everybody, everybody was running. It was all my fault. I shouldn't have thrown this stupid party. Three of the victims were treated at the hospital and released shortly afterwards, but a fourth person was more seriously injured. Evan Ward, a 19-year-old, was shot in the throat but miraculously survived. A month later, Clearfield City Police announced that they had arrested two shooters, 19-year-old Mark Anthony Pisana, a Norteños gang member, and a 15-year-old boy who was a Isai Longos gang member. However, the closest anyone ever came to replicating Project X was called Project P, which took place in Macosa County, Michigan, and ended with the most memorable post-party interview of them all. The Project P Facebook page was created in July of 2014. Five days before the event, a promotional flyer was posted that read, prepare for the craziest event of your lifetime, with the host names as well as a parking fee of $3 per car. This party was set to take place in Hinton Township, Michigan, which can be described as literally the middle of nowhere. There is not even a gas station in this town, but the power of the internet prevails. In a total of around 2,000 people, mostly under the age of 21, showed up to the farmhouse about two hours outside of Detroit. The party was equipped with DJs playing live sets, a fire thrower, and exotic dancers. Since the party was in a rural area, noise was wasn't an issue. No neighbors were around to complain. Police were actually called out to the scene for a traffic complaint and cars parked in the roadway. But then the 911 calls got more serious. He has no calls. Everyone knows he's OD18 on heroin. You guys need to come out here now. I have no idea who this guy is. Because we just talked to somebody that's having a heroin overdose and they're putting him in a vehicle and taking him out. Are they no, not? not? He's, he's not in a car right now. The person called again saying, We just called about the uh, guy who was overdosing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get people to help me get them out, and no one will help me. Okay, then so do whenever you, the ambulance gets here, like... You're, you're, my you're ambulance gonna, can't get there. There's too many people. Unfortunately, the dispatcher couldn't even help them. Although it's easy to criticize law enforcement and public safety officers, a remote town like this is not equipped with the resources to service this many people, and the road being blocked just made it that much harder. After the event, six people had to be hospitalized from drug and alcohol overdoses, and one man broke his neck after falling off a roof. As if it couldn't get any worse, there was a report of four men carrying off one girl and taking turns assaulting her. Police arrested three of the organizers named Daniel Mincer, the birthday boy, Brittany Johnson, the social media promoter, and James Taylor, the homeowner. In the state of Michigan, they have what is called a social host liability law. The law states, anyone who provides or sells alcohol to a minor can be held criminally liable. However, they can also be held civilly liable. If a minor who was served alcohol causes someone's injury or death, the person who served them can be held responsible for compensating the injured for their damages. So if someone leaving the party as a drunk driver smashes their car into someone's home, the host of the party can be criminally charged. Also, another law that actually landed the three in custody was that they were collecting money for parking and serving alcohol. When you collect money and serve alcohol without a liquor license, that is a crime in Macosa County, Michigan. Despite all the repercussions the host faced, he did not seem to care at all. I didn't force anything down anybody's throat. I didn't make anybody stay here until 7 a.m. or 11 or whenever it is everybody finally left. I didn't make this kid pass out on my floor. People wanted to be here. That was their decision. And if you're a parent that's got a 14-year-old child that's been able to be at my house all night, and a par according to the police, there was a lot of them here. So I think some parents should do some reflections on their parenting before they start getting mad at me. You say to anyone who says you're responsible. I am. It's my house. You got to deal with it afterwards, but apparently it was worth it. And just like in the movie, he received nothing but a slap on the wrist. After taking a plea deal, he does not have a felony on his record. He just has to perform 80 hours of community service. Our expectations for the morality and decision-making skills of teenagers are way too high. Teenagers are easily manipulated and often make mistakes. Now, is Project X to blame for these parties? 
Probably. But the media outlets are just as guilty. These news outlets spend all of their time comparing the parties to the movies and love pointing their moral superiority finger at the kids. But clearly, they never finish watching the film, because they still fell into the trap of inviting the teenage host onto the news. And the reason they invite the host on is because they need to. They profit off delinquency, crime, and hide it under the guise of it being news. But in reality, they want this stuff to happen so they can boost their ratings and make money. These kids throwing these parties are clearly not trying to hurt anyone, nor are they trying to cause chaos. But their dumb teenage brain told them that this will make them a legend. And for a lot of them, it kind of worked. Because their post-party interview on the local news cements them in history as one of the most epic party throwers of all time. This movie even inspired me to make a Project X style song and music video. It's called Party Crasher. So go check out the video and let me know what you think.